Simon Pay, Zoe Saldana, Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, John Cho, and Carl Urban. Okay. Do you know my jacket? I do. I know. The bridge is yours. So high tech. Okay, the first question, just to kick things off, is obviously this is a very big year. It's the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. So for all of you, sort of the challenge to make a movie that A, is going to honor the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, B, uh, be the next level in this trilogy of films, and C, also be just a great action movie for people who are not fans or have never even seen a Star Trek movie before. Let's start. Simon? Uh, yeah, that was very important to us. Doug Jung and I going in and Justin, um, we wanted to sort of try and create a hybrid of an episode of the original series with you know, a spectacular cinematic event. These films, the Star Trek movies have always been event films. With the TV series, you get time to, to spend with the characters. It's a longer game. With the film, you kind of have to hit it. It has to be very self-contained. It has to be memorable. And, and so that was the, the, the thing, was to try and make sure everybody that's been here for 50 years gets what they deserve in terms of a good Star Trek film. But the people who've never seen it before, uh, who, who perhaps aren't as familiar with Star Trek, they don't know about Kirk fighting in whatever you said, Scott, uh, you know, <laughs> then they, they're welcome too. This is an inclusive universe in every way, not just uh, fictionally, but uh, factually. Thank you. Also, you know, you really shake things up in this one. You know, the dynamic, uh, the Kirk Spock dynamic has been explored twice before already, but now, uh, definitely going back to the old show, you have Spock and McCoy together a lot. And what is a good film like with great drama? So, how was it for Zach and Carl? to really spend a lot more time together and further explore that dynamic of these great characters. Yeah, for me, I feel like this is probably uh, the most fun that I've had um, making a Star Trek film. Uh, I think what Simon and Doug were able to do uh, was present probably the most well-defined, well-rounded version of the character. And uh, it certainly gave me a, a lot of material to work with. And I had an amazing time working with Zach, and I have a huge amount of respect for him and his approach. And it was just great to have those two characters that are so diametrically opposed to each other uh, be forced into a situation where they have to depend on each other to survive. And through the process, come to a deeper understanding of who they both are. Um, and uh, it was uh, obviously a, a great opportunity to explore a lot of comedy, but then to also really kind of deepen the relationship between the two. And, uh, and I think that by the end of it, they were able to go back to their respective corners with a, a bit of inside knowledge. And uh, uh, I think that it's, uh, for long-term fans, a, uh, a rewarding interaction. Zach. Well, I couldn't agree more, Scott. Carl took all the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Literally, I gave all those exact same answers. Uh, in my head. No, uh, Carl and I had a great time working together. You know, um, in a movie franchise where we're used to spending so much time together, all of us really, on the bridge of the Enterprise and in many of our adventures, it was actually really nice to have so many days where it was only Carl and me together, and I think we got to know each other and appreciate each other already more more than we already did um which was already a significant amount and um yeah and i think from a character standpoint i i really echo the idea that these two characters historically in this franchise are uh com come at things from entirely different perspectives and points of view and uh, i think there's nothing more fun for fans of the original show to see that dynamic unmitigated by Kirk, who usually manages to get between them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and I think in the same way, you know, Bones really saves Spock's life in this film. And I think, uh, I think there's a deep appreciation for that, obviously. Um, and um, and, and they, they end this film in a, in a much better place as a duo than I would say they begin it. Well, another thing that sort of is a throwback to the original show is the dynamic between McCoy and Kirk. In the beginning of the film, Chris, you have that scene in the bar where you're contemplating, uh, what's it all mean? I mean, it was right out of a, a scene from the Corbomite Maneuver or Balance of Terror. 
So what was it like to just explore, now that you've been out in space, or the, the crew of the Enterprise? Uh, I, come on, you got the right moderator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, you could be in the next film, Scott. Fine, you're in. Thank you. Jeez. That's what I was getting at. Jeez. But uh, to, to sort of explore, now that the Enterprise has been out in space for 966 days, almost three years. Uh, did you get that reference, 966? I, did get reference. I got it. Yeah. Yes. 9th September 966. That yeah. was very good. Did you deduce that on you your own, not, seriously? Yes, 966, I got that. You, you literally got 966. I wrote it down. Zach, that's, that's, that's Scott Mance you're, you're talking, talking to. to. I know, I'm he talking to Star Trek but, but, but it's Come like on. the limits of my, my, they just are always exceeded. Like, I just really think you can't get any nerdier. Well, no. <laughs> but that moment when Spock is, is, is uh, ailing, it was like that scene of Bread and Circuses, <laughs> where McCoy says, I know why you're not afraid to die, you're more afraid of living. I mean, come on, I'm your guy here. You are. But back to good. Kirk and McCoy, let's talk about Chris, the, like, where, where is Kirk three years into this mission? I mean, he's not super excited about being a Starship captain. Uh, yeah, I always have, the most fun in these films are either when we're laughing or talking, um, and then usually then shit blows up and then we have to do the shit blowing up acting, which is, uh, I, th I think I spend the majority of the film saying, let's go. <laughs> Can we do it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And then just breathing heavily. <laughs> uh, so that scene in particular was one of my, was one of my favorites. And um, I talked a lot with Simon about how to nuance the, uh, or what particularly was Kirk's um, trip and this whole thing and uh, once we landed on the the idea of him growing out of or moving out of underneath his father's shadow that made a lot of sense and to do it with with Carl was great fun and we had all that fun stuff with the whiskey and the vodka moment which you know just like these just little itty bitty things that make us giggle and have a good time that hopefully people appreciate and uh, as you said it's all these little nuance beats of the the references and whatnot so. that was improvised by the way when they were talking about i thought he'd be a, a vodka guy that all came out from those guys on the day and that's the kind of superb actors we get to work with as writers it's like sometimes you just go go with it and they do and they come up with the best lines well, I've not always to the audience right away <laughs> no. okay why don't you start uh, yes, uh, as a fan of Beastie Boys, thank you that uh, Sabotage ultimately beat the aliens. I might be alone in this, but I want to ask Simon, in your discussion with Justin and Doug, uh, your decision including, the, including this classical music, as Bone said. Uh, it was a, it was a, we just love the idea of them foiling a, a technologically terrifying threat with something very analog and old, VHF, you know, it was like radio. The, 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 the initial idea was that they fired an old radio into the middle of the swarm. It, it took many shapes as we wrote it, but we realized that was, obviously there's no sound in space. We have to abide by physics some of the time. So um, it was just the idea that, you know, we like the idea that Jayla had discovered this old ship that had an archive of music. She, she discovered rap music and liked it. You know, she says she likes the beats and shouting. And, <laughs> and we like the fact that in the end they use it to kind of, you know, cause the swarm to have this big... And I like the fact that they all have the idea together about what, what it could do. And, you know, the, Sabotage was a song we used in 09, and it, it, it's part of Kirk's childhood. It all links, all these things link back to his past and his dad. The motorbike, the song, it's all kind of him letting go of these, these things, you know, and moving on as a man as well. So it's important for Kirk's character. But it's just a kick-ass song, you know? I mean, yeah. if anything's going to blow up a swarm of spaceships, it's going to be the Beastie Boys. Come on. <laughs> Scott Hoover in the... The film has such a lovely tribute to Leonard Nimoy, and I'm curious, was there initial expectation earlier on in the process that he would be part of the film before his passing, and how did you figure out how you wanted to pay homage to him? If Leonard was well enough to be a part of this film, I'm sure he would have been, and I know that there were early conversations with him about that possibility, which, uh, you know, true to his uh, incredible self, he knew himself well enough to know that that wouldn't be possible at a certain point. And, uh, and then I think it became important to all of us to figure a way to honor his legacy. And I thought Simon and Doug uh, did a beautiful job of incorporating it into the narrative of the film. Um, we all carried him with us through this production for sure. And it was definitely uh, a different kind of feeling to make this movie without him, for me in particular. Um, but I think he was very much a part of it in spirit and certainly in the film now and, uh, and, and will be a part of anything we do moving forward for sure.
we wanted to make it part of Spock's arc, uh, Zach Spock's arc as well, not just a, a reference to, to, to Spock Prime or, 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 or you know, what, what we did eventually, which, of course, which was to dedicate the film to him. But it, 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 what we wanted to have his passing be something which inspired our Spock to move on as well. And so it became an integral part of the story, not just a kind of nod in, in Leonard's direction. That felt more right to do it that way. My question is for Mr. Simon. I heard the director say that the main reason he wanted to tackle this project is because his childhood dream sort of was to blow up the Enterprise and then bring it back together. Mm. So I'm wondering, was that a collaborative effort or was that all his idea that he presented to you and then you guys developed it in the script? I hated the idea at first. We had literally, <laughs> I, I, I swear, we had like rows about it. Like I'm the, I was shouting down, at him down the phone going, you can't do that. You can't destroy the Enterprise. Uh, my, my problem was that we've, if, if you think it's something new, then we've seen it before. It happened in Search for Spock. It happened in Generations. But Justin was like very, very determined. And as we spoke about it, I realized what he was doing brilliantly was he was not only sort of taking out a main character, but he was removing the physical connective tissue between the crew to see what happens when you take away the thing that physically bonds them together. You know, if you take away that thing that, that, that necessitates their being a unit, do they dissipate or do they come back together? And that was the genius of that thing. You take it away very violently and, and dramatically, and then you wait and see if they all come back together to be this family, which is essentially what they are. And, um, and of course they do. And, and I realized I backed down immediately and, and said, yeah, you're right, which I, will, I do occasionally do that. Not always. <laughs> uh, but in this instance, I realized it was a brilliant idea. And, um, but yeah, initially I was opposed to it. Zoe, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of your character and also her feelings for Spock in this movie? Um, she's tired. I think she's homesick. And I felt that that's the one thing I appreciated the most about what Simon and Doug that did for, for this installment is that they, they made us, they made us human, you know, and, and, and just homesick and sad and, and, uh, and how being overly worked and being away from home and all the things that keep you grounded can put a strain, not just on the intimate relationships that you may have, um, but also, you know, the professional ones. And um, I thought I would never see the day where I, can, I, I would see, like, I would walk into the Enterprise and we're kind of like not rolling our eyes at each other, but we're not that, you know, excited to see each other. And um, so, I, and, and I thought, okay, well, this, this is a great place to start because I, I can only imagine where we're going to end up. It's like, and we literally end up in, in the opposite direction. We're, we're, we're dying to be close to each other. We're dying to save each other and be, get back together. So I thought, okay, that's brilliant. And, uh, you know, she's, um, I guess the relationship with Spock and, and Uhura felt so normal and human to me that it's sort of the consequences that, that may occur when you decide to love your coworker in a, in a in, you know, in a lovey-dovey way. And, <laughs> you know, it just sometimes the professionalism can get in the way of, of, um, of the spirituality. And I feel like that's what happened between both of them. And I, I do have a feeling it was probably like her decision to sort of go, listen, you have a lot of stuff that's about to start brewing and from your end, and I have to figure some stuff out. So it's just probably just- That was your me. decision? <laughs> Come on, be a gentleman. Think what you need to. Yeah. <laughs> I think it ends on a really hopeful note, don't you? Yeah, yeah let's go I with hope. But I mean, but if, if he were to walk in with some other Vulcan girl, or I, shit would go down, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that Vulcan amulet would come right off. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wonder if, if anyone else could uh, contribute to this, but since it is 50 years now since Star Trek began, it seems your character especially has gone through uh, changes that sort of mirror women's changes, perhaps, in science fiction, in, in our culture and society. Can you talk a little bit about how you think she's evolved to what you're doing now? I so think there's, there's a beautiful, um, I, I hate using the word sprouting, but it's true. Women are becoming very, very independent, not just, um, not just to add, add 
in the workforce, but also in their personal lives. There's just something about like realizing that you, you should want to be <clears throat> a part of something. You don't necessarily have to be a part of something in order for you to be validated or, or respected or appreciated or considered strong enough. So I feel that, that this breakup that Uhura and Spock have is, is amazing because she fell in love with her teacher. So he came as this figure that represented responsibility and safety and, you know, and maturity and wisdom. And now I think that she feels strong enough to, I mean, I, if I choose to see it that way, there is a parallel uh, um, universe situation here that's going on with Uhura and women these days, is that uh, there's no longer this animosity or this resentment to sort of prove who you are. You just want to be alone. You just want to be left alone to sort of find out who you are because you're interested in it. You're curious. So I like this autonomy that's happening with women right now where there's, um, it's, and I like when, when, a, when a battle is fought just with a spoken word, nothing that feels tense or, you know, violent behavior or something, I guess. You know, one of the questions that we were asked, um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, for giggles on the on the tour in either Sydney or London was, uh, which timeline would you choose to be in the original series or, or ours if you had the choice? And I did say ours if forced to choose for this reason, like there, Roddenberry did set up a world, you know, uh, that was incredibly progressive, but it was tempered by the the social mores of the era. And I feel like we can go further in, in, in 2016 than he was able to do at the time, and to your point, I feel like uh, that this our version is able to give more to the women and the people of color uh, in the cast than 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 Roddenberry was originally able to. I think, and not yeah. because he didn't want to either. Not because he didn't want to. Correct. Yeah, yeah. He absolutely wanted to. Yeah. Well, let's talk. A, let's go a little further with that, John, on, on how Sulu has evolved, <laughs> and and uh, and really like when that idea came up on how to really give more background into Sulu's character. The idea came up, uh, I, I believe Simon pitched it, and then um, I was told of it uh, through uh, Justin early, pretty early on and when he had uh, set up at, at Paramount and, um, and we went in to have a chat and get reacquainted. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful idea. I had concerns about how it would be received uh, by George. Um, I had some other concerns, but it, it was really uh, the handling of it that was most important to me. And having seen the film, I think uh, its nonchalant posture toward it is uh, the best thing about it. And the fact that it's normalized and, and, and it comes, it's kind of news now, but if you rewatch the movie in 10 years, you won't think anything of it. Yeah. It'll just go right by you. and. Um, uh, that's the best thing about it. it. There's no music cue. There's no close-up. It's just... Dun, it dun, just dun. <laughs> <laughs> He's gay! Oh that was... Gonna <laughs> 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 start running around screaming in your He's gay, everybody! <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like the one thing that I guess has, has taken a, a secondary <laughs> position is that it, it wasn't just that we revealed that he's gay, we reveal that he's a father. So uh, none, of the, none of our characters have uh, families that we've ever talked about. So I, I, I actually feel quite puzzled that in 2016, um, we're, we're having like a, a, a bit of a fit <laughs> over who he, who he fathered a baby with. The point is- I'm is happy he, he's a dad, you know? He had somebody on Yorktown. What the, the, the point, <laughs> the of point is he's story. promiscuous. He was compromised. <laughs> 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 what we wanted to do was put somebody we care about in Yorktown. So when Yorktown was under threat, that, that yeah. made the threat tangible. We knew that Sulu's family was there. So it, made, it wasn't just a bunch of faceless Federation people. There was somebody there that we cared about too because we care about Sulu. And, um, and that was really the important thing. The nature of that relationship w w wasn't, wasn't an issue. And by the way, the whole thing with George is, you know, people like to make things into a spat. George and I email all the time. Big, long, lovely discussions about it, and and we're on great terms. It was never a kind of a, we were never shouting each other or anything like that. It was just, and it's a great discussion to have. So, um, I'm I'm really happy with the way that it's been talked about and responded to, and and I'm still a huge fan of, of GT for sure. Right here. 
This film is a bit bittersweet with the loss of Anton, and Chris and uh, John have spent quite a bit of screen time with him. Uh, what was it, this process working with him, and if anybody on, on the cast has heard from his family and their reaction to this film? First of all, it's devastating to lose a family member. And, um, you, you know, we're, we're at a point where we should be celebrating not only this film, but this beautiful man, this talented man. And for all of us, it is um, almost incomprehensible to be at the point where we have to talk about him in the past. Um, and the pain of his loss is still very raw. Um, we went and spent time with Anton's family and um, we, uh, we know that they will be very, very proud of his contribution to the film and this film will forever be probably the most special experience for all of us. For, you know, it represents a golden period where our family was together, fully together for the last time and, and it really was, I think as Simon said, uh, the best summer of our adult lives and um, we love him so much, we miss him terribly. You know, in the original series, in episodes like Who Mourns for Outer Eyes, Gamesters of Triskelion, Spectre of the Gun, <laughs> Kirk. This is a bit, right? What? This, this is a bit. This is actually a follow-up because Kirk was like a father figure <clears throat> to check off. And in this movie, Chris, you got to spend a lot of time with Anton. So, like, what, in your opinion, just made him like a really special actor? He was, he was just a good, um, he was a good guy. He was just a good, he was a good guy. He was very sweet, beautifully, authentically Anton. There was not <laughs> much of a censor on the boy. And um, I remember one of the first times I met him, like nine years ago, whatever, he was 17. And um, I invited him back to my trailer to, to play guitar because I knew he played guitar and he played guitar really, really, really well. And he said, I can't, man, I gotta go back to my trailer. And I was like, okay, why? And he's, he was translating a, <laughs> wasn't like he was, he was translating a, like an esoteric Russian novel into English <laughs> just because that's what he wanted to do. And, Eight, nine years later, I talked to him and he was still translating it and he was still reading this book on physics that this French philosopher had written and he still tried to get all of us to go to these, <laughs> these like, he'd be in Vancouver and he wanted to see some German neo-expressionist film that none of us, and he would talk about as if everyone has or should have seen it. No, well, um, well, my husband was the only one that called him. He was like, hey, are we going to go see this movie? He's like, oh, I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up going that night. With you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think. I think <laughs> he was a great guy. He was, he was just totally fearless. And I think I would, uh, you, know, you try to grasp onto something that's a positive out of losing such a... Um, such a good guy and I think it's just be fearless creatively. He was always working on stuff. He had music projects and photography projects. He was gonna direct his first film this summer. He was just spectacularly interested in life in a really a great way, so. Who's got the next question? Um, yeah, this is for Simon. Um, what would uh, Tim from Spaced like and dislike about this movie? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, this is a, for those of you who don't know, I started out in a sitcom in the UK called Space, and it was about a nerdy guy. I don't know what I was talking about. I was, it wasn't me at all. Uh, but there's a line in Space where Tim says, as sure as eggs is eggs, as sure as day follows night, as sure as every odd-numbered Star Trek movie is shit. <laughs> and I wrote that in 1998, I think. And then here we are in 2016, and I've written an odd-numbered Star Trek movie. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to say that Tim is wrong. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 it's an incredible thing to look back on the circularity of that, you know, uh, of having grown up a fan of Star Trek and, and, and science fiction to be now participating in such, uh, in it in such an active way. Um, I tried to just make the kind of Star Trek movie Tim Bisley would like, you know, that's what Doug and I did. And when I say Tim Bisley, I'm talking about the people that have been with Star Trek for a long time, you know, because Star Trek must have been doing something right because it's around for 50 years and if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it. So we, we, we wanted to embody the original show. 
instill it with what made the original show great, but also frame it in a, uh, in a, a big movie way, you know, which is uh, a luxury they never had back in the day. That's why the series turned into such a great thing. They, necessity was the mother of invention with that show. They, they had to make these wonderful little tele plays. They couldn't rely on special effects. Now we can do both. And it felt like, you know, I was always thinking, what would Tim Bisley think? Front row right here. Uh, the film felt like a throwback to the TV shows where they go on alien planets and fight. So what was it like for all of you being away from the con and in space and actually on a foreign land fighting enemies? I like being on the ship. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. No, you don't understand. We were like in a quarry and ugh, it was just dust everywhere and <laughs> helicopters flying really low. And I just, I don't know. I like... <laughs> And I like being on the Enterprise. It's cleaner. <laughs> the Modern, spirit of exploration. <laughs> on the upside, it was. <laughs> on the upside, it was cool to be paired off. So even even though you were having a miserable time, uh, no, I enjoyed. I enjoyed but you heard how much you. I was complaining. But I was so happy that I was complaining with you. <laughs> um, to get fractured off, you just it, it, you know typically you're. As characters relating on the bridge, everyone's relating to Kirk, you know, and and um, so there's less talking to one another, and so just getting that opportunity brought out some different colors and vibes. So it was it was good. Doug and I realized a couple of times had had you ever had Chekhov ever spoken to Sulu at any point in the other two movies, like directly to? I don't. We realized recall. a couple of the characters hadn't really interacted at all. It, there's it, a lot of panicky glances. Uh, <laughs> A little bit. They were <laughs> on a bridge, looking at each other. Don't give away the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Again, look who you got here. All right, who's next? Uh, Bibbs. For Simon, you're kind of living the dream. You get to tell the people in Star Trek what to do now after all these years. I um, asked them nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But I don't know. Like, I would have, I have like notebooks full of stuff that I would like to have done on my favorite shows and movies. And I was wondering, is there anything in Star Trek Beyond that you just always wanted to see in a Star Trek movie since you were young that you finally got to do and that was really important you to add in the movie? Um, I think the kind of, the, the business of writing a good story and, and making sure the plot were all that kind of superseded any kind of you, you know, sort of uh, wish fulfillment. We had to start with that, really. I mean, the whole uh, splitting up the, the, the crew into different little interactive groups was nice. I love the relationships in Star Trek, and it was nice to pursue those a little bit more specifically, particularly with Bones and, uh, and, and, Sp and Spock. And uh, the, as Chris mentioned, the scene with uh, Kirk and Bones at the beginning, which is a kind of vague sort of parallel to the scene in Wrath of Khan when, on Kirk's birthday when Bones and Kirk have that moment together. But um, it was just... The whole thing, you know, getting getting the keys to that kingdom was was a real joy, and and it was nice to sort of be able to to write our signature underneath the hundreds and hundreds of signatures that have gone into writing the Star Trek universe over the years. It was nice to put our little stamp on that, and um, you know, fill it with little Easter eggs that only we know about. Right here. Since you guys were working with Justin this time around. Uh, you're a family in a different location, you're not in Los Angeles. You kind of have to uh, rally together a little differently. What was the dynamic working with Justin compared to JJ? I mean, Justin has a very different energy about him. I'd say he's a little more internalized just as a person. He's a little quieter, but he's no less confident. Uh, he's incredibly gifted as a visual storyteller. And, uh, and I think he's really sensitive to character dynamics as well. He brings a balance of both of those um, extremes. And uh, he came in on an already moving train in a lot of ways, you know? I mean, he didn't have a lot of time to prep for this film. And uh, I think all of us were incredibly impressed by his sense of leadership and vision. And uh, I think also it was really great to have Simon uh, in a position of creative influence on this film because he was a, a tremendous conduit for us early on before we kind of forged our own relationships with Simon, uh, with with, uh, with Justin. Um, but all in all, I mean, he was a really welcome addition and, uh, you know, I would say very different from JJ, but also really exciting and really unique in his own ways and um and and reflective of this experience which was different and new for us to be away from 
the past and the, the configuration of the last two films, but uh, we all had a, a great time working together and we really enjoyed him and seeing what he was able to create in, in the final product is, uh, is really exciting for all of us. Back to the front row right here. Hi, my question is about prop and costume. It's uh, costume is very seems tight, so you had to <laughs> skip the lunch sometime, or <laughs> any any prop episode. It's like a the gadget looks like a kind of old cell phone for me <laughs> sometimes. So tight it's around like, where? <laughs> <laughs> I think the pants were looser, right, guys? We all, yeah, we all talked about it. fantastic this time. <laughs> so much movement. A lot, of, a lot of space in the hips, which I appreciated. Um, yeah, there was a lot of... Uh, I don't know how to answer your question, but I, I will say... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up my own question and then answer that. So, uh, but there was a lot of... Um, you know, this is kind of... It's like the retro super future version of a Star Trek. So it's, it's looking way ahead into what Star Trek can become and, and also having very specific nods to the past. And one of the very small things is like throughout the three iterations of the film so far, there have been a lot of discussions about colors of yellow, for instance, for Kirk's shirt and, and the cut of the, of, the, um, of the shirt. And this one is a very, you know, a, a specific nod to the, to the original series. It's not the kind of bright, fantastic yellow of the, of the first and the second. It's this kind of, you know, lovely Kirkian mustard green. So, um, <laughs> and um, I had a lot of lunch. <laughs> I think Sonia did an extraordinary job um, as our, our costume designer. One of the things I was most proud of was the fact that, uh, un unlike the previous two films, that um, we got to do with JJ for whatever reason. I don't know what the reason, but the women, uh, the women in, in the Starfleet uniforms in Star Trek Beyond, all have ranks on their uniforms, which I, um, I think is a fantastic thing. And a fan pointed it out to me, and I was shocked that uh, that wasn't the case. So one of the first things I did when I got to Vancouver was go and talk to Sonia about that. And she said, oh yeah, don't you worry, women will have ranks. So I think she did a great job. Definitely. Yeah. I bring this, like, also bring like a bit of a, a, a 60s was, throwback to, uh, to the costumes, but then also making them uh, slightly uh, new. I had massive envy for Chris Pine's uh, survival Suit. Yeah, but you get that that just wonderful shade of blue, Carl. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you look lovely. <laughs> Ruddy complexion of yours. How far do you see the franchise going now with these characters? And is there any you know thoughts of a spinoff uh, with the next generation and so forth? And then also just the fun question of what was the greatest takeaway for each of you from this film? Like, what was the best moment you had with each other or in the pairs? Well, I hope it goes on for another 50 years, you know, and whether that's, we'll keep going as long as we can until we're old and inappropriate. <laughs> Some of us already are, I say, <laughs> me. Uh, uh, but, you know, and who knows? Actually, the thing is about the new timeline is that Picard, Janeway, all those guys, they don't exist. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> man, would I be in trouble. Uh, yeah, I hope, it, I mean, I hope it goes on. There's a new CBS series starting. It's all about, you know, the, the, the galaxy, let alone the universe, is, is a boundless place. And there's so many adventures to be had. And as long as we have this idea that, you know what, we might not just all kill ourselves and die in a big fire. We might actually become <laughs> slightly more enlightened, slightly more tolerant beings and go off into space. That is a lovely idea that I think secretly the vast majority of us want to achieve, you know. Um, Longevity, Star Trek would yes. live forever, yeah, longevity, absolutely. Well, I just, you know, you just said something about, like, the next generation. Are you calling us old? <laughs> <laughs> we just got here. It's only been three movies. <laughs> no, no, here's cooler. <laughs> let's, let's be present. Tom. <laughs> Stop wishing your life away. <laughs> Hi, Mikey from the LA Japanese Daily News. Uh, I just want to touch very briefly on what uh, you mentioned earlier. The beautiful comment, by the way, about 10 years not noticing anything different. Uh, I spoke to George this morning on the way in, and he and I were talking about how... Oh, my. Start <laughs> <laughs> That's weird, because he says that. <laughs> he, he says that sometimes. You've met the man. But he and Brad and I were talking about how... This, the, the original Star Trek, 
because you mentioned they didn't have a lot of special effects to rely on, they relied as much on social commentary and reflective of the change at the time uh, to sort of propel their, their story forward. In this day and age, I guess the question is, what can the message be now? I mean, you, you know, in the Oscar so white realm of things, and I look at this cast, and what can the, what can the message for Star Trek be in 2016 to help propel it forward? Like you said, perhaps for another 50 years. Well, I mean, I think the message is the same as it was when it began. It's just that we have more room to explore and express it um, than they did at the time. Uh, you know, it's shocking to me how divisive our culture has become. And I feel like Star Trek maintains a position of inclusivity and um, unity that uh, is as resonant today as it was in, in the late 60s. Um, you know, there, this film in particular explores that idea. Um, one, one side of that being about the unity and inclusivity and the other being about breaking that apart. And, um, and I think that's in a way really reflective of the society we live in today. Uh, it's troubling to me on such deep levels that we've gotten to this point of uh, unwillingness to see uh, varied points of view or uh, feelings or opinions or perspectives. Um, and, I, and I think that Star Trek remains in a, a landscape of uh, popular culture entertainment, something that is um, a beacon of inclusivity and, uh, and progressive thinking. Uh, I think it just takes on different forms now than it did 50 years ago. I think the film is actually even more opposite. It's become more so in the last, even since we shot it, mm. you know, the message of this, the social commentary in this iteration of Star Trek is we're better together. That's what it's about. It's about collectivism. And in this era of Brexit and talking about building walls in certain places, you know, now more than ever, we should be thinking about the value of collectivism, about cooperation and, you know, unity. unity. That's our, that is, that can be and is our strength. And the more fractured we become, the less secure we all feel, you know? So, it, yeah. you know, the, the, the villain in Star Trek is like, we could have called him Brexit. It's quite a science fiction name, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying, you know, like when you go into, you know, in the Star Trek uh, uh, setup, you're going into space and seeing so many different kinds of species. It does become uh, comically apparent when you look around the planet Earth that we live on that we do have so much more in common than we don't, you know. Uh, so, it, it, you know, the, the, the little things that seem to divide us here in our present time seem even more exaggerated, exaggeratedly small. Uh, after seeing, you know, an episode of Star Trek, so. We've all got one head. Do you know what I mean? Let's live together. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, last question? Okay. Well, I just want to talk about Sophia for a second because I thought she was pretty kick-ass in this. And what, what moves did she show you, Simon, on uh, any kind of action moves? Sophia's incredible. She's Because she's a dancer, and so she's in physically so adept, so she was very up for... <laughs> Um, you know, the physicality of it. It's funny, I told this story the other day, that, that when we, Doug and I and Justin in the writing room, which wanted to create this, this very independent female, very resourceful character on the ultimate surface, and we were trying to get a point, we didn't have a name for her, so we, we, we used to call her Jennifer Lawrence in Winter's Bone. That was her, <laughs> that was her long name, and so we go, okay, so Scotty lands there, and then suddenly Jennifer Lawrence in Winter's Bone comes out, she fights these guys, and it started to get tiring, always saying Jennifer Lawrence in Winter's Bone. It's a long name. So then we started calling her J-Law, and then she became Jayla. So, uh, <laughs> Jayla is basically named after Jennifer Lawrence in Winter's Bone. Um, but yeah, we, there, there aren't enough girls in Star Trek. You know, Zoe has a lot on her shoulders, as, she, as you know. And uh, so we wanted to increase that. And also with Commodore Paris, you know, as a, as a figure of extreme authority. Uh, yeah, Sophia, we all love Sophia, don't we? She's a nutcase and a, and a, a golden addition to this, this group. So um, she, uh, she's awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Star Trek Beyond opens July 22nd, a week from Friday. Thank you so much, Carl, John, Zach, Chris, Zoe.